This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. What I'd like to do this afternoon is give you an overview of uh, our work over almost eight years now trying to understand the metabolic pathology of autism and particularly the potential role of oxidative stress and epigenetics in the pathophysiology of autism. My uh, introduction and interest in autism um, stemmed from a very serendipitous finding. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. I, we were doing a study in children with Down syndrome, looking at our metabolic profile, and for the study we were using siblings uh, as controls, which is appropriate. They have two copies of chromosome 21. Um, and one of the pairs, uh, the control child, was distinctly abnormal. Uh, to the point that I called the parents to find out, you know, what was with this child, and it turned out that that control sibling had autism. So from that N of 1, uh, we launched a pilot study to see if that was just a fluke or whether, in fact, it might have been a real finding. And we did find that it did replicate, and which led to another study, which led to another study, which leads me here today. So I'd like to uh, review for you what we have found since that first serendipitous finding in one child with autism. So this is an outline of what I'm going to be presenting. Um, I like to start these lectures out with an overview of um, three interconnected, interdependent pathways of folate, methionine, and glutathione metabolism um, that we found to be abnormal in many of the children. And we find it to be that it suggests that many of these kids may have chronic oxidative stress and impaired methylation capacity. So I want you to bear with me for the first few slides because I think if you can put the data in this metabolic context, it'll have a lot more meaning for you. And then I'll show you our data and um, evidence uh, in case control studies where we find uh, an increase in oxidative stress, damage, and DNA hypomethylation in many of the kids. And then I'll give you some highlights of a paper uh, where we, we did an open label trial, clinical trial, to see if we could improve uh, the metabolic profile. And that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And then also highlights from a study uh, last year, a paper that was in FASIB Journal, where we're looking in lymphoblastoid cells to see if this plasma profile is reflected intracellularly and also in mitochondria. Then I would like to give you an introduction overview of what I consider the wonderful world of epigenetics. And um, I really, at least from my point of view, think that this may be the next frontier for autism research. And I will apply that then in a paper uh, that's just in press, the American Journal of uh, Medical Genetics, looking at the mothers of children with autism. And we're looking at their metabolic imbalance, a polymorphism in the reduced folate carrier gene and DNA hypomethylation, and that's the epigenetic uh, connection, and we see it in the children as well as in the mothers. And then I'll end with some theoretical implications. Okay, so now for these three pathways. Um, the, let me get the pointer. Um, the first pathway, um, I told you there are three interconnected pathways. The first one is called the folate cycle, 
And in this reaction, uh, it's driven by a fascinating enzyme, methionine synthase, this methyl group, CH3, from folate, tetrahydrofolate, THF, is transferred first to B12, and then within the enzyme transferred to homocysteine to generate methionine. So that's the first cycle, and then the second cycle is called transmethylation, or the methionine cycle. And here, methionine is activated by ATP to make fascinating uh, molecule, s methionine, fondly known as SAM. Uh, and this molecule is the major methyl donor for a huge variety, a multitude of methylation reactions, essential methylation of DNA, RNA, proteins, phospholipids, um, and involved with epigenetics, that's our epigenetic connection. Uh, very uh, important, derived, again, the methyl group is derived here from folate, that's the connection, transfers that methyl group to the methyl acceptor, and then once it gives up its methyl group, it becomes SAH, or s adenosyl homocysteine, which is then broken into its two components, and homocysteine picks up another methyl group, and this goes round and round, and the purpose of this cycle is to conserve or maintain uh, methionine, which is an essential amino acid. We can't make it. So this is a way to recycle methionine so that it's always available for ongoing protein synthesis and these essential methylation reactions. And this ratio then of the methyl donor to SAH, which is actually a product inhibitor, is our best indication of the methylation capacity. And then finally, and this is as far as we go, we come to transsulfuration. And here, homocysteine leaves this pathway, one, one way reaction down 2B6 dependent steps to cysteine. Cysteine is the rate limiting amino acid for the synthesis of glutathione. And I'm showing glutathione in its two forms. GSH is the active form, and it's that SH sulfhydryl group and the donation of the hydrogen that is how glutathione acts as a major intracellular antioxidant and detoxification mechanism. Once, once it gives up that hydrogen, two GSHs are now linked at the sulfhydryl bond. GSSG is the inactive oxidized form that then has to be reduced back to the active form. And it's essential that this equilibrium be far, far to the left with a hundredfold excess of the active form compared to the oxidized form. And this ratio then provides the reducing environment inside the cell that is essential for normal cell functioning. So that's it. The folate cycle leads the methionine to transsulfuration. Now let me put these, path, these molecules into a functional context for you, and I'll think, I think you'll see why we think this is uh, such important pathways. And again, they are linked. Uh, the methyl group is linked to the methylation, which feeds down to glutathione. So these three pathways are very interactive and highly regulated. If we take the folate cycle out um, a bit further, it provides one carbon groups for the synthesis, de novo synthesis of purines and thymidylate for DNA synthesis, for um, proliferation, for immune function, error-free DNA synthesis growth are all dependent on that one carbon metabolism from folate. The methionine cycle provides the methyl groups for, again, um, these essential methylation reactions that are involved, as we'll see, in um, epigenetics. So there's DNA, RNA, proteins, phospholipids, neurotransmitters, uh, many essential reactions. And then that pathway leads down to redox homeostasis. And this redox homeostasis of the GSH-GSSG ratio is critical for membrane signal transduction, for the activation of redox-sensitive enzymes, uh, transcription factors such as NF-kappa B and cytokines, um, for the decision to differentiate or proliferate is this redox balance, and then if it goes to an extreme, uh, it can lead to cell death. And again, as I said, they are interactive. If you have a problem over here with folate, it's going to affect methylation, which is going to affect glutathione, so they're all interactive. This is what glutathione looks like, the structure, and again, here's that rate-limiting amino acid, cysteine in the middle, and it's this SH group, that sulfhydryl group, which is the important part, donating that hydrogen is how glutathione works as a quenching free radicals and as a, an antioxidant. 
Glutathione is also the major mechanism for detoxification of environmental exposures. It's a magnet for heavy metals. It's the natural chelator of the cells. Heavy metals will bind to that SH group spontaneously and create a conjugate that now is protected, the cell is protected. There's an enzyme called glutathione S transferase that will create that conjugate for many environmental exposures, which is then uh, metabolized and excreted. So that's the way we eliminate a lot of toxic exposures. This is just a simplified way to explain redox balance. Basically, we have, this is a laundry list of free radicals and oxidized molecules, and we have an equal amount of antioxidant, uh, redundant uh, antioxidant uh, molecules that will counteract. And these, this is actually uh, in, uh, in, in a balance. We breathe oxygen, we, we um, use oxygen for oxidative metabolism, and so many of these free radicals are formed spontaneously, and these are here uh, to, to neutralize. But when we have environmental exposures, um, they become even more important, the antioxidant buffering. So any situation, whether it be a increase in the pro-oxidant side or just a decrease in the antioxidant defense mechanism can shift that balance where you have uh, cell damage and cell death, and this can be self-amplifying. So you can start with just a problem with glutathione, that's going to increase oxidative stress, which is going to then um, self-amplify. So that's it. Let me show you now just with the, um, let me back up, with the uh, diagram we've been working with, what we see in the children with autism. And basically, we see low methionine compared to age match controls, and its product, the methyl donor, is low in many children. The, 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 meth, the SAH um, is actually a product inhibitor of the methyl transferases. So that will decrease the ratio, and we're going to be looking at the effect on DNA methylation, but it's much more than, than DNA methylation. It's a product inhibitor of most methyltransferases. And then we see it feeding down. We see a decrease in cysteine in the kids and a shift in this glutathione ratio. So I just wanted to put that in a diagrammatic form uh, to kind of imprint you with that. So we think then that these children, based on that abnormal profile, that, that we could describe them as having a fragile homeostatic balance, that this may underlie the reduced capacity to methylate and an increased uh, vulnerability, if you will, to um, pro-oxidant um, environmental uh, influences. So now let me show you some of the data that backs that up. Um, this is a paper that's actually under review now in autism research. Actually, this is the third uh, replicate uh, in three independent case control studies um, where we're seeing the same thing. So we're really beginning to believe this, this is real. Um, what we added in this new paper, um, the third replicate here, uh, was added, we added uh, sibling controls. And this is important because if the, if the pattern, if the metabolic pattern in the sibs was similar to the cases, we really couldn't say much about autism because they share genes, they share environment. So this was an important question for us. Um, are they different uh, from, from the cases? We also added evidence of DNA hypomethylation, which we're calling epigenetic dysregulation. It's unusual to have a loss of methyl groups on DNA. And we add uh, some evidence for oxidative damage in the kids. So this is our actual um, data looking at, we're looking at the paired sibling, this p-value is actually the sibling compared to their controls, to, I'm sorry, uh, compared to the cases, and we're seeing a decrease in methionine, uh, and this is the pattern we've seen with unaffected controls, uh, unrelated controls. We see this decrease in SAM, increase in the product inhibitor, and a decrease in this ratio that reflects their methylation uh, capacity. What was even more interesting was that the siblings were not different from the unaffected control children. So this was very comforting, actually, that it, in, in, in these metabolites that the siblings are very different from, the, um, from their affected uh, 
autistic sibling, which again says that there's something then it is different in autism and it's not there in their, um, in their SIBs. This slide um, uh, is, is making the point that this capacity, the SAMHSA ratio is basically the capacity to methylate. And we're showing that, um, that the capacity to methylate is, is decreased, case control. And now we're showing that a methylated product, DNA, is also decreased. So this actually takes the capacity to the next step, which is that, in fact, it looks like they are um, less able to methylate. In this case, we're looking at um, DNA. And now we're looking at the bottom half of our pathway, and this rate-limiting amino acid for cysteine is low in the kids um, in their, compared to their SIBs, and the SIBs were not different from the uh, unaffected controls. Uh, free glutathione was kind of in the middle, uh, was significantly different, um, but not different uh, uh, from the controls. And GSSG, I think, is actually, this is the oxidized form, in the plasma is extremely interesting because it shouldn't be high in the plasma. It, it isn't generated there. It, the source is from, is it from cells who are undergoing oxidative stress, can't keep up, and they export, export the GSSG to try to bring their uh, redox balance back to normal so they get rid of it, and it's in the plasma. So this in the plasma, this uh, elevation, reflects an intracellular problem as well, which is interesting. And of course, then the ratio was um, decreased. And here is kind of the same thing, where we're looking, uh, the redox ratio is, was decreased. That says their capacity um, to uh, control oxidative stress might be less. And here we're looking at two um, product, two uh, oxidized protein products, the nitrotyrosine and chlorotyrosine, um, are modified, oxidatively modified uh, protein derivatives. And here, so that's protein oxidative damage. And here we're looking at 8-oxideoxyguanine, which is in DNA. So we're showing here that this reduced capacity is reflected in actual protein oxidation as well as um, DNA uh, oxidized product. So that was, uh, supports what we've seen. Important caveat, however, um, it's important to remember that this profile is measured um, in children who already have autism. They are already diagnosed. We don't, so we can't really say that it's predictive or it had anything to do with the development. We'd like to say that, but in fact, we can't. Um, it could be a consequence of inflammation, gut inflammation, for example. So we want to make clear that we're, we're looking, actually, to see how early we might detect it. We've got a study in uh, developmentally delayed children where we look at their profiles at 18 months, 24 months, and then follow them. And the idea is to see those that develop autism was their metabolic profile very early. At least we're getting closer to an involvement during uh, development. But at this point, we're measuring them age 3 to 10 uh, years, and so it's the presence of autism. I want to make that clear. We did look um, between uh, parent report of early onset and regression phenotypes. They were identical. There was absolutely no difference. So then we uh, asked the question, um, can we supplement these kids with metabolic precursors, the methyl B12, which is part of our um, cycle, and folic acid and folinic acid? Um, to improve glutathione levels. And this is an important question for several reasons. Parents are now supplementing their children with high dose methyl B12 as well as folinic acid um, and report, report uh, positive effects. Um, but this is based on no scientific evidence, no, um, this is just anecdotal and word spreads. So it's out there. and. We don't know whether it works or not. This is, again, parent report. For me, this, this trial was important as a prelude to a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to prove to myself that something is happening metabolically because these two B vitamins actually feed into our cycle. So this study was published in the American Journal of uh, Clinical Nutrition last year. So this, again, was an open-label trial. Uh, it was three months' duration with 
high dose methyl B12 and phenylic acid. We were very careful with subject selection to try to make the most homogeneous population that we could. So it was only autistic disorder, defined age, no previous supplements, and most importantly, we pre-screened the kids that came in and, and I decided whether they qualified. If their glutathione levels were normal, they were excluded because there's no place to improve. So we selected for those kids that looked like they need, um, uh, could use some uh, supplement support. So we looked at their uh, profile and also we did the Vineland. And this just shows in that same cycle uh, where these vitamins work in. This comes, this is a pre-methylated B12 and the phalenic acid supports that folate side of our um, cycle. So these are our results um, and it didn't come out exactly as I had uh, predicted but it was quite interesting either way. Because these are uh, precursors for the methionine cycle, I had thought maybe our methionine cycle metabolites would go up, but that was not the case. But when we get down to the uh, transsulfuration, the cysteine and the glutathione, yes. Cysteine levels uh, with this three-month supplementation increased to the normal range, um, glutathione increased significantly, and most importantly, this oxidized form that's reflecting the intracellular redox status decreased with three months of B vitamins, and the ratio uh, increased significantly. Um, so our interpretation uh, is that this, this improved statistically but did not reach normal. So possibly what's going on is that these methionine metabolites that feed the lower half uh, were being pulled down to glutathione as synthesis as the priority. Um, at least that's our interpretation, but I think if we had higher doses or longer, whatever, but I don't think these would increase until this had uh, reached normal levels. And I just like to show this slide because biochemically these kids are as heterogeneous as they are behaviorally. Uh, on average, they, this oxidized form does go down, but you can see it's all over the map. So whenever you look at the mean difference, there are clearly exceptions, and our goal is to try to understand the ones that, the subset that did respond, and the same with the ratio. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of them that are not, that, that's all over the map. So just to summarize then, we saw that uh, they were different, again, from uh, age match controls. We didn't see an effect on transmethylation. We did on the cysteine glutathione levels. Um, but again, although they were improved, they did not reach the level of controlled children. And so that's our hypothesis for why the methionine cycle did not reach normal. We did do the Vineland um, and looked at the subscores. And so let me just show you that data. This, we did not publish this data, however, because it was parent report, open label trial, very subject to expectation bias. But Nonetheless, the results were interesting. Uh, we did see, and this is again, parent report before and then three months after treatment. We're seeing a, a, a significant increase, except in motor skills, in these subscores, um, which, again, we, it, it, this is a confounder, the, the, the parent report, and yet, um, it's interesting, interesting enough to me that we have now launched a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of broad-spectrum uh, nutritional supplementation, um, and we'll see what we see. But that's really what the parents are interested in. I mean, I think that we can improve the glutathione status is very important um, biologically for immune function, for, for growth, uh, they're healthier. But of course, the parents want to know, does it affect behavior? And that's what we hope to uh, um, find out. So basically, it gives us um, the preliminary evidence I needed to launch you know, a very expensive uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So that is ongoing. Uh, it's an, actually a nine-month uh, crossover study, so it's going to take a while. But uh, I, again, I think we have to look at these um, these interventions that the parents are doing in a more scientific way so that we can tell them, yes, uh, it does work, and in which subgroup, or no, save your money, and, and the physicians also uh, 
need this type of information. Okay, so now I want to switch gears a bit and show you um, our uh, experiments in lymphoblastoid cells, which we were able to get from uh, N um, NIMH. In these uh, AGREE uh, Autism Genetic Research Exchange, in, in these cell lines, uh, one of the qualifications is they have at least one affected sibling, so they're highly genetically predisposed. Um, so we took pairs of the case and control cells uh, and cultured them identically, and we measured the rate of free radical production uh, and our glutathione ratio before and after exposure to thimerosal, which is a well-known sulfhydryl reagent. It depletes glutathione, so we use that as our oxidative stress. And this is the baseline. This is before adding uh, any ox extra oxidative stress. And we're seeing at baseline the same pattern that we've seen in the plasma, which is a decrease in the glutathione, an increase in the oxidized form, and um, a decrease in this redox potential or redox ratio. And this uh, actually is a cool experiment. You load the cells with dichlorofluorescine or DCF, and this is a molecule that will not fluoresce until it's hit by a free radical. So you can load the cells, put them in a fluorimeter, and read the generation of free radicals in real time. And so this is our results at baseline, and then as we add increasing doses of thimerosal, what you can see is that it's actually being driven by what was there at baseline. I kind of thought we might see an exaggerated response as we add the oxidative stress, but we didn't. The delta is pretty much the same. It's there at baseline. Same with the ratio. It's, it's there before we just, before we start. And again, these cells are cultured in um, CO2 incubator. They're, they're exposed to oxygen, so they're, but you can see that the, um, the autistic cells are more sensitive. With lymphoblastoid cells, you can grow up 20 million cells and actually isolate the mitochondria to look to see the ratio in the mitochondria. And this is, was interest be, uh, for us because we think that that's mitochondria are probably the source of the free radicals. And we're, again, we're seeing the same, um, the same uh, pattern with a decrease in the mitochondria, which mitochondria can't synthesize glutathione. They have to import it from the cytosol. And they don't export GSSG very well, so they're very sensitive. And they depend on, actually it's NADPH, to reduce uh, the glutathione back. So the, but interestingly, we didn't see, uh, in, I don't have the slide, a, a, a difference in ATP levels, but in reading the literature, it turns out that when the mitochondria get uh, in trouble uh, with oxidative stress, they upregulate anaerobic glycoly glycolysis for ATP production. So that may be why we didn't see uh, a difference in the ATP production. But the glutathione looks like they are stressed. So we think that these uh, data may suggest that um, genetic or epigenetic differences, these, are, these aren't exposed to um, environmental toxins. This is in culture in an incubator. Um, so we think that this is uh, some experimental evidence that uh, cells derived from children with autism may be more sensitive to pro-oxidant exposures because that low glutathione ratio would say they have less they're more vulnerable, they have less capacity to buffer when, when exposed. Okay, so now we're gonna get to epigenetics. Um, this was on the front cover of Time Magazine uh, this year, January. Um, why, DNA, why your DNA isn't your destiny, the new science of epigenetics. So now let me give you an overview. And our, I'm gonna show you our evidence for um, a decrease in the methylation cycle, metabolites, and the DNA hypomethylation, which is, it's global. We're not looking at gene specific right now. We're just looking at total uh, methylations uh, in DNA, which is our link then to this epigenetic dysregulation in the mothers. And this was not part of our original game plan. We were looking at the kids and mothers usually bring in the child. So we thought, well, we'll just stick them too. And the results were very interesting and, and really quite unexpected and actually, I think, very interesting. So this is the same uh, metabolites that we looked at, at the in the kids. It's the same, but a little different. Um, methionine levels were uh, decreased in the autism mothers, 
I'm not sure this is a functionally, statistically, I don't know whether that's a functionally significant difference. No difference in the methyl donor SAM. Um, we did see it, it's decreased in many autistic children, but it was no problem in the, in the oops, I've got some arrows here, in the mothers. But this, SAH, is really interesting. This is highly unusual uh, to have SAH. This is the product inhibitor of the methyltransferases, um, and it's increased in 40 to 50 percent of the moms. It's very unusual. And of course, the ratio is decreased driven by the SAH in the denominator. Um, adenosine and homocysteine are the products from the SAH, and, and they will when they accumulate, it's known that they will uh, force that reaction back up to SAH. So we're wondering whether that might be what's going on with the increase in SAH, but that's very unusual. And folate levels were decreased. So here we're looking at the same thing, that this capacity was decreased and we're looking at total global genome-wide DNA methylation, and we measure that as the percent 5-methylcytosine in DNA. And we're showing that, um, that the SAM cell ratio was decreased, as well as, again, the methylated product. So it's similar, a little bit different uh, origin, but similar in the mothers as well as what we saw in the, in the children. Again, another important caveat, um, these samples in the moms were taken uh, three to ten years after the birth of the child. So we have no evidence that it was there during gestation. We're, we need prospective studies and we're working on it actually with the Marbles group uh, to try to look at whether we can see changes uh, during uh, pregnancy with the outcome, which I think will be very interesting because this profile is treatable. And if it's there during pregnancy, it, it, it suggests the possibility of prevention if it has anything to do with it, um, with, with development. But um, anyway, I'm very excited about the Marbles collaboration. Okay, so what is epigenetics? Um, it's how cells uh, control, maintain, change gene expression. It's how uh, cells, it's the on-off switch for gene expression. Uh, as a response to an environmental cue, how the cells can turn on and turn off gene expression um, in the presence of a static genome. Um, these changes are heritable within an individual, um, and they don't involve a change in DNA sequence, so it's somewhat counterintuitive. Um, the two primary mechanisms are DNA methylation and histone modifications, and it turns out that it's methylation and acetylation of uh, histone um, amino acids and tails. I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. A good way to think of it is if you think of the sequence as a hard drive, then epigenetics is the software that determines whether, how, and when the sequence will be read. And that's the best, easiest way to kind of put your mind around it. So how might it apply to autism? Well, we know, as I've pointed out, that the, the methyl group from, uh, that's on DNA and also the methylation of histones um, is derived from our friend Sam. That's the methyl donor for the DNA methyltransferase and the histone methyltransferase. And they're inhibited, those enzymes are inhibited by SAH, which is elevated in many of the moms. So as I said, that, that ratio then, that capacity we've shown to be decreased in many kids and their moms. Um, and this, these patterns are heritable uh, between generations, and they can be altered by dietary deficiencies, by, pro by toxic exposures, and oxidative stress, or the environment. Um, and again, it's a way to provide within the individual of a way to respond to uh, and adapt to environmental um, uh, exposures, and then this may be compromised in autism, or we're hypothesizing that. So let, this kind of gives you an orientation um, of what I'm talking about. Uh, here's our divalent chromosome. Um, as we unwind, we get to nucleosomes, which are a core of histones with two turns of DNA around it, and these tails, these are amino acid uh, tails sticking out that turn out to be very important for um, gene expression. 
So here are, actually it's called the epigenetic code, and here's the histone tail modification, and if we keep unwinding, we get to the double helix and then to single-stranded DNA. And I wanted to point out that the methyl groups on DNA are only on cytosines. It's a cytosine methylation and only cytosines that occur at CG dinucleotides. That's the target for the DNA methyltransferase. And this is just a side-by-side -side comparison, again, to help you put your mind around epigenetics. We're all aware of mutations which are permanent, uh, if they're not repaired, permanent base alterations that are then inherited transgenerationally. Epigenetics, our DNA and our histones, here's the methyltransferase methylating the DNA, this post-translational modification of the histones lead to something we call phenotypic plasticity. And it's a form of cell memory of an adaptive change. And a, and a, a good example is T cell memory. T cell, memory T cells have, have been programmed to be good to go, and their methylation pattern is different from naive T cells. Another good um, example is tissue-specific gene expression. Every cell in the body has all the genes for all gene expression, but liver cells only express liver genes. That's because the genes for kidney, brain, intestine are all turned off, and they're turned off by methylation, and this occurs very early in embryogenesis. Um, and again, it is dynamic. It does respond to environmental cues, and it's mitotically heritable. So this is the last slide to just, again, help you put your mind around it, how genes are turned on and off. Here's the nucleosome with the DNA and the methyl group. And here are, here's the histones, and here are the modifications. There's actually more than this, but we're going to, there's ribosylation, sumolination, acetylation, phosphorylation, but we're going to look at just methylation and acetylation of this amino acid tail that protrudes from the nucleosome. And here's the DNA, here's the cytosine, the DNA methyltransferase, putting that methyl group on number five position in, in cytosine, and this is the epigenetics. And the bottom half shows how it works. And first, the top part is a hypomethylated. These little red dots are now clear. This is hypo, DNA hypomethylated DNA, and that histone tail is acetylated. And it's thought that the acetylation of uh, lysines, for example, and histone creates a charge uh, repulsion that opens the DNA so that the transcription factor can get in. And this is generalizing, and there are exceptions, but for introductory purposes, this is basically it. It's accessibility. And then below, when, the, when this gene, and it's usually the promoter region, or around that region, is hypermethylated, and now it's not acetylated, um, the transcription factor can't get in. The, the, the DNA is com compacted, so it's that easy. But it has a lot to do with histone meth the, the histone modification and the DNA methylation. So that's an overview of, of epigenetics. The importance of methylation, again, in general, uh, when a promoter region or is turned on, uh, I'm sorry, is methylated, it's turned off, it's, it's condensed, and when it's unmethylated, it's turned on, it's more open, the transcription factor gets in. The normal embryonic development depends on the correct methylation pattern to be established very early in embryogenesis. We're talking blastocyst stage. Um, that methylation pattern that determines uh, tissue-specific gene expression is set up in the mother, in the, in the embryo, uh, very, very early. Um, and again, responsible for tissue-specific gene expression, chromosome stability and integrity. Many methyl groups are around the centromeric, pericentromeric region. Um, X chromosome is inactivated by dense methylation of the inactive uh, X chromosome, and it also methylation suppresses viral inserts, repetitive elements. So now I'm going to show you our data um, in this, actually this paper is now in press. Um, we're looking at a functional polymorphism in the reduced folate carrier gene and DNA hypomethylation in mothers of children with autism. 
So how does maternal genetics, metabolism, uh, and epigenetics uh, affect uh, development? Well, if you think about it, um, the, the mother is the incubator. Her genetic and epigenetic profile will be reflected in her metabolic profile, which provides the microenvironment for the developing fetus. So that actually prenatally, um, she, she is the environment. Um, and so her metabolism, her genetics, epigenetics, um, can affect the fetal synthesis, methylation, expression, and neurodevelopment. And again, this, this may be important because this abnormal met, uh, met, met, metabolic uh, pattern is treatable. So in this uh, study, we obtained um, 500 case parent trios, mother, father, and child, and 500 controls, actually 530, um, from NIMH. And we genotyped for five polymorphisms in candidate genes that functionally affect transmethylation metabol metabolism. There's a, this is a highly poly polymorphic pathway. We selected five that have some evidence that they functionally affect um, the pathway. And then we applied two statistical tests, the transmission disequilibrium and maximum likelihood ratio test, to, s to determine was this variant gene acting through the mother and or through the child. And we measured the um, metabolites. So let me just re remind you what we saw in the mother. We, had an, we saw an increase in uh, adenosine and homocysteine, which can reverse that reaction. Make, it goes both ways. When these are increased, it goes up, can reverse uh, SH hydrolase reaction, which will increase SAH, which is a methyltransferase blocker and can be associated with um, DNA hypomethylation. We also saw a decrease in thionine and folate. So he, these are the polymorphisms we selected. We looked at the two MTHFR uh, SNPs that are known to decrease MTHFR activity, which will decrease the generation of 5-methyl THF, which drives our pathway. Um, we also looked at the reduced folate carrier um, polymorphism, and this codes for the protein that, that uh, transports folate into the cell. And this is important because uh, folate is an essential uh, vitamin. We can't synthesize it, so it's getting in by this um, carrier, reduced folate carrier, uh, primarily. Um, we also looked at transcobalamin 2, uh, which uh, is the codes for the protein that gets B12 into the cell. And uh, MTRR is methionine synthase reductase, which keeps B12 in a reduced form so that it can accept that methyl group. So there's some evidence that, that those polymorphisms may be important in our, in our pathway. So just to summarize, we, did see, we saw no significant differences in either MTHFR um, or TC2 or the methionine synthase reductase. We did see an increased frequency in, of the RFC1, the reduced folate carrier 1 uh, polymorphism, interestingly in the mothers, but not in the fathers, and not in the children. And as we pointed out, the metabolites were abnormal. We use this metabolic profile actually as a phenotype, basically. Uh, it's affected by genes and environment, so it gives us clues to select candidate genes. So we consider this profile really a, as, a, as a phenotype. So this is the actual data, um, and looking at the G allele frequency that was increased in the mothers, but not the, um, not the children and not the fathers. Um, the heterozygote and homozygote increased in the mothers, um, the heterozygote slightly in the children, causing the combination to go up, and zip in the fathers. We applied the transmission dequith disequilibrium test, which is a way to, to look to, uh, whether the, the, the allele is over-transmitted from the mother or the father, and we did not see any over-transmission from either mother or father. And then this is the two statistic tests. They're based on uh, modeling, log, log linear modeling, and it's a way um, to predict uh, genetic relative risk and something called the maximum likelihood ratio. Uh, it, it takes all 
the genotypes just within the family and statistically uh, can predict if the child ha inherits one or two G alleles, um, when we look at the uh, relative risk, it was not significant. If the mother carried one G or two G alleles, it was significantly different. And then applying this uh, maximum likelihood ratio test, uh, which is a way of modeling where you can eliminate the, the genetic effect of the child and or the mother, if we just look at the risk associated with the child's genotype, it's not significant, but it is highly significant if uh, we remove the effect of the um, child. So this is our evidence, that, and which is really quite interesting, I think, that it, it, here the mother is actually the genetic case and the environmental factor, uh, and it's independent uh, of the child's genotype. So it kind of opens up uh, some new thinking, I think. Um, we also uh, compared genotype with DNA methylation status, uh, reference in heterozygote and homozygote. If you look uh, horizontally, there's a trend with the G allele uh, for a decrease in, again, global or uh, genome-wide methylation. Um, it's not present in the uh, control mothers. Um, but vertically, if you look, there are actually, there are always the um, case mothers have uh, lower methylation than the control. So obviously, <laughs> something else is going on. Um, in addition, obviously, to uh, the RFC1, but at least it seems to be uh, contributing. So again, we think that these observations suggest a broader paradigm of autism gene environment interaction that encompasses the mother as the genetic epigenetic case as well as an environmental, uh, fetal environmental factor. And this inclusion, I think, of the maternal genetics and epigenetics um, could provide new insights into the pathogenesis of autism. And I sort of played, I like to play with um, PowerPoint, and so this is kind of just a pictorial way of looking at that. The um, gene environment interaction in postnatal is, is well known, but we might also add the effect of the maternal genetics on um, the child as well as fetal environment. So because epigenetic modulation of gene expression really lies at the interface between genes and environment, it may prove to provide, to provide a molecular explanation for the downregulation of gene expression in the autistic brain, gut, and or immune system. And we are now pursuing that uh, in postmortem brain, which I'm very excited to see what we see. So potential factors uh, contributing to uh, autism, uh, clearly uh, there's a, a genetic component and an environmental component, and we're now thinking that there is an inflammation infection component involved and hormones as well because of the gender difference. But again, all of this depends on the dose and timing that may affect the immune, the neurologic, and the GI pathology. And the dose and the timing also may explain part of the heterogeneity um, that we all are very familiar with. There are challenges with a purely genetic approach to autism. Um, there's going to be multiple genes involved. Uh, and they're going to, most likely, the consensus is now they're small effect genes uh, to develop the autism phenotype. To complicate it worse, it's, it's likely that there are different combinations of genes in different autistic individuals. Then if you add to that, if the genetic susceptibility requires an environmental trigger, then you're going to find the identical genetic risk factors in people without autism who didn't get the environmental hit. So it makes it very, very complicated to try to unravel the genetics. And uh, there are a lot of array studies going on, but again, they haven't been as definitive as, as I think, um, the vision and the hope. So many of us have started looking uh, at the possibility of a more systemic approach um, to autism beyond the brain, um, looking at what we're calling uh, the autism triad, which is the three systems that are most commonly affected in autism, the brain, the gut, and the immune system. And this slide is just to point out that these systems are not, are, are not independent. They have a lot of crosstalk between them. They're independent. If there's a problem with one, tends to affect the other. 
All three systems are sensitive to redox changes and oxidative stress, um, especially during critical environmental, I'm sorry, critical developmental uh, windows. The trajectories of these three systems um, depend on appropriate environmental signals. Um, the brain, they're all uh, immature at birth. The brain requires sensory input, the immune system, antigens, the gut, substrate, and they mature uh, after birth. Um, and they're both, uh, all of these systems are, interact with the redox status and are vulnerable to both gene and environmental influences. So it's not much of a stretch to hypothesize, at least, that if you have uh, a problem in one area, it's going to affect the others. This slide is to make a point, and again, I'm not a toxicologist, but doing a, doing a literature search, um, it's interesting I, to note that, that these types of um, exposures, and I've sort of lumped them into metals, solvents, and uh, industrial chemicals, there's nothing in common structurally with any of these. So structurally, they appear to be independent, but with a literature search, they all are associated with glutathione depletion and oxidative stress. And we have to remember that, that the, the safe levels of, of all of these are determined independently, um, the, the toxic level, the safe level. But we have to remember that um, subtoxic doses, when combined, and we're never exposed to one by alone, could reach a toxic threshold. And this is just a way of, of, of looking at, at this diagrammatically. This is homeostasis, and with a robust uh, redox ratio, when there's a toxic insult, er, there's a dip, but it never reaches the toxic threshold and then comes back to normal. Under conditions where we're calling a fragile homeostasis, where you have a decrease in this redox buffering capacity and you get the same toxic insult, it's more likely to reach a toxic level and cause, um, cause damage. So this brings up new, new questions. Um, should we be looking at a broader paradigm for autism beyond uh, brain genes and, and um, beyond brain genes? and a more systemic approach to, uh, that, that is looking beyond the brain. And, and that leads to, could there be a component of a metabolic encephalopathy that could be potentially reversible? And we all know that these kids have good hair days and bad hair days. So when they have fever, they come into focus. What does that mean? Uh, to me, that doesn't mean, it means that it's not totally hardwired, that if we understood what happens when they come into focus, that could be a redox shift, it could be a metabolic shift, uh, which is a fascinating concept to me. And we think that our oxidative stress hypothesis then encompasses the possibility of gut-brain immune interaction as well as gene-environment interactions. So how do we get from epidemiology to mechanism? Well, we all are very familiar with the fact that uh, gene expression can uh, is uh, our, our genes can affect our vulnerability to environment, and the environment can change gene expression. Um, but we've got multiple additive uh, genes as well as multiple additive and variable environmental factors. So they're both, in most cases, necessary, but alone, and again, in most cases, are not sufficient. But what if we interject this metabolic phenotype, our redox ratio or our, our methylation potential? That may get us closer to mechanism, which may help us better understand um, the behavior. Most importantly, this is treatable. If we can fix that, the big question with our, our trial is, if we can fix that, does that change behavior? And again, that's a big question mark, and stay tuned. So our working hypothesis then is that evidence of oxidative stress damage in the children strengthens the hypothesis that an impaired antioxidant reserve and or an inability to resolve inflammatory insults may promote this increased vulnerability and predisposition to autism. Um, this, 
I don't know if you've seen this, but this is on my wall. This is the map that all biochemists, this is every metabolic pathway in every cell. And you look up H3 and you can find the one of your interest. And I just like to point out that <laughs> there's a lot out there we don't know. And, um, but we think it's quite interesting. And then finally, I want to acknowledge my group uh, in the lab. Uh, Stepan Melnik is the HPLC guru that uses electrochemical detection to measure nanomolar levels of these things that aren't available commercially, unfortunately. Um, Stephanie does our genotyping uh, with help from Alina. Shannon is a pre-doctoral student in the lab. She's actually taking the mitochondrial data uh, a bit further, looking actually at mitochondrial enzyme activity, and she's also interested in um, cytokines and immune, immune response. Sarah um, is a assistant professor, and I didn't show you her data, on mitochondrial membrane potential, and Lessa helps step on with the uh, HPLC, and we have our study nurses and our funding, and that's it. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? What harm comes from adding methyl B12? It's a, it's a water-soluble vitamin. Um, no known toxicity, to my knowledge. Would you agree with that, Josh? Yeah, um, and, and this is pretty high doses. Um, and it's, you know, the excretion is way high. Um, whether it's acting by mass action, we don't know. Um, some of the parents have reported hyperactivity. Uh, we have, don't have a clue what that means. We've not seen hyperactivity. Um, we, uh, in our double blind study, we ramp up B12. I think hitting it with high dose was like hitting metabolism with a sledgehammer. And I'm really careful. So we actually ramp up quarter, half full. And if there's any um, uh, adverse hyperactivity is the main one, we come back down. And we have not seen that. In our open label trial with methyl B12, um, we had four dropouts, um, two moved. One had sleep problems, but they had sleep problems before. And one. Um, was hyperactive in, in class. I believe that was it. Um, but most, I, was, I think it was 75% of the moms wanted to stay on it um, after the study was over, which is interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you very much. It's a, a very interesting implication, too, for a group that we work with, uh, with chromosome 22Q deletion syndrome. You see a high. Uh, genotypic correlation, very low phenotypic correlation, and, and methylation differences might contribute to that, but um, really exciting stuff. One question I had, did you look at um, birth order effect? So you drew blood three to ten years after the Most birth of, of the children, and, and was the, the last child born, was the child with autism, or, or was there a child, an older child with I, You autism? know, honestly, we didn't actually measure it, but I, my recollection is um, usually the SIB was older. The, the older child. Mm -hmm, so because be usually once they have the autistic child, they're yeah. <laughs> kind of reticent to have right. another So one. that might explain potentially some of the variability in, uh, in the differences. Um, not, at least in the literature, uh, glutathione levels are pretty, pretty stable until puberty. And then they start to change. Um, and then they're uh, stable throughout reproductive years, but then as you get into elderly stage, they do change again, so. Do they also change in response to sort of stressors over time that the mothers might be dealing with in terms of raising their children? Yes, uh, and that was actually one of the conclusions of our, of our study was, um, we, well, the RFC1 kind of was, was an interesting find, but at the, our first um, study in JAD, one of the interpretations was it could be simply the stress of, of dealing with a child because stress will decrease, right. psychological stress will stress that pathway. Right, so the chronic glucocortic activation or insulin, insulin insensitivity could also contribute yep. to some of these issues. So. Yeah. Well, 
actually, I'm going to just call myself because it's kind of an extension of that. In that study, did you have any data on uh, nutrition and which, dietary supplements? On which study? I'm sorry. Um, the study where you compared the. Um, well, I don't have my glasses on now. I can't see which one. Uh, okay, were you? Oh, actually, no. I'm sorry. This is actually slightly off the subject. I was thinking about the mom's study. The, we, yeah, um, their nutritional intake? Yeah. We compared um, vitamin uh, supplements, over-the-counter supplements, and that was, and between the cases and controls, they were not statistically different. Um, we did not measure food intake, but with fortification, usually it's, if it's, it's the 400 micrograms in the, in the vitamin that's going to shift. I may have missed it, but I just wondered what the dosages of methyl B12 you were using? Mm -hmm. This is, uh, again, the way the parents are and the physicians have recommended. Uh, this is an unusual way to give it 75 micrograms per ml injectable. And this is like an insulin syringe. It's a teeny amount and a teeny needle, and they just they say that it's easier than giving the child a, a pill, it, and they just pull down the diaper and it's over. Uh, and so they get it three times uh, a week or every other day. So it, it is definitely high dose. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. In addition to um, asking about um, maternal stress, because your background with Down syndrome and cancer, I'm guessing you've probably already looked at this, but are you looking at maternal age in combination with some of these other factors as an epigenetic influence as well, with some of your data? Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, uh, methylation, global methylation levels do decline with age, but not in those reproductive years. If it's going to decline, to, to my knowledge, it's later in life when there's a gradual loss and, and, it, and can be affected by environmental exposures as well. Right, just so, um, I, I, purpose group and others looking at the influence. One, yet one other thing to look at between um, individuals with autism and typically developing children, maternal age being a factor. I'm just wondering of that possibly being in the mix here as well. That, that, Maternal age also being in the mix here, along with your other findings, you don't think they're Yeah, our average age was um, 32, I believe. And we didn't have any, I mean, we may, I'll have to check, but I don't think, there wasn't a large group of women over 40, for sure. May have been one or two. Hi. Jill, that's, um, oh, this is really loud. Um, your reduced folate carrier data are fascinating. Frequency of the allele in the population, it seemed from your Arkansas population that it's about equally distributed, the polymorphism. That it's what? About equally distributed, the A and the G. Yes, and that's, I think, fairly. So it's quite common, the polymorphism. And, and uh, you also showed that with a single allele, your effect statistically seems to be at least as good and maybe even greater oh, even than better, yeah. when, you have, when you have homozygosity. Right. So my question is, is there any evidence of functional differences that we know of with reduced folate carrier? The implication is some transport of folate transplacentally is affecting all of this. And so mm -hmm. what do we know about the reduced folate carrier with respect to the polymorphic forms? Is there anything known? Um, it's, it's, some, it's inconsistent. Some studies show an elevated homocysteine and some do not. I think most show lower folate levels with the, with the G allele. But it, there's not a lot out there, I must say. Thanks. Uh, this may be a dumb question. No, no, never uh, a dumb question. almost a black and white difference between um, uh, fathers and mothers. Yeah. Were there any differences between daughters and sons? We only had DNA from sons. We didn't, 
ask for daughters. You can you can select your characteristics for your population. So again, I'm just trying to be as homogeneous as possible because we know it's heterogeneous. Awesome. So two questions. In, in normal mothers, if you, one of the problems that we have in our gene expression data is that you get this huge overlap, even though there may be statistical differences. So my question is, if you look at your normal mothers, are there some that are quite aberrant that look like autism mothers? Mm -hmm. That is, mm -hmm. you would expect that there are mothers running around this room who are at risk for having children with autism. Yeah, but statistically there were fewer, but oh yeah. There are some outliers. You know, something that I just saw the data a couple of weeks ago and it's really got my mind spinning. Uh, we collaborate, uh, that's actually where we get our uh, control moms, uh, with uh, birth defects uh, center uh, at, at our hospital. And um, we do the metabolic profile for the mothers of children who, or mothers of children who have a heart defect. And I'll be danged if it doesn't look similar. <laughs> the SAH is up. Yeah, one, uh, one, one, uh, one addition. Compared question. to the control. What happens to your markers just in a normal pregnancy? In the first trimester, well, we for hope example, where <laughs> we I hope mean, with you don't marbles. need autism mothers, just normal mothers. Well, there, there, <laughs> uh, you know, there's not a lot of data out there, but in normal mothers, what I've read is the homocysteine actually may increase during pregnancy and then go back to pre-pregnant value. Um, but actually, with the marble study, we hope to see something that may be predictive. Thank you for a great talk. Um, my question is about the specificity of these findings. You mentioned developmental delay, and my colleague next to me has been whispering in my ear about Fragile X syndrome. But have you looked at these same pathways, um, or has anyone looked at these pathways in individuals with ADHD? No, not to my knowledge. Um, they have looked at them with schizophrenia and Alzheimer's and um, homocysteine. Is different. Actually, in, in uh, maternal homocysteine was associated with third, third trimester homocysteine was associated with increased risk of schizophrenia. Uh -huh. It's kind of interesting. That is that is interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can do a search on it and you'll find it. Um, coming from a fragile X perspective, I, you know we do see. Uh, uh, we have a paper in press about um, uh, mitochondrial problems and pre-mutation, and there is enhanced oxidative stress. And we've used high doses of folic acid for a number of years in, in Fragile X, and it does have a psychotropic effect. But now... It does have a, a what effect? It has a positive psychotropic effect, folate does. Very um, interesting. But uh, now parents are very concerned about some of these papers that have talked about uh, increased rates of cancer uh, in uh, individuals that have been supplemented with high levels of folate. So I'm, I'm very It's a interested. hot topic, yeah. Yeah, I'm very interested in what you think about uh, these reports. Well, I think uh, the jury's not in. What they do know is that, you may be aware of vitamin folic acid is synthetic. It's not the same as in food. And the concern is that synthetic form is, is clearly higher in individuals that, that supplement with folic acid, the oxidized form. Um, we don't know what it, what it means. I don't think the jury's in yet on that, but it's, it is a concern to a lot of people. If a mother has one typical child, or neurotypical, and one autistic child, is the assumption that the first child who's neurotypical did not have an oxidative stressor, or is it that the mother may have had an exposure after having child one? Well, that's a good question. Um, it would have to be a, a, a guess, because um, we don't know. But that would make sense, because it, it, the, the genetic susceptibility may be, or variation may make her more vulnerable, and maybe with the neurotypical child, she didn't get that exposure, because her genes most likely didn't change. Um, or perhaps 
for whatever reason, her diet was not as good during the autism pregnancy, and you know there could have been a, a folate issue because diet is an environmental factor. Or the introduction of thimerosal with child two that wasn't introduced to child one. To the mother. Yeah, during a flu shot. Good question, and I don't think we know the answer, but it's. I don't know um, the dose, actually, the poison is in the dose, and whether 25 micrograms or whatever it is of thimerosal in one flu shot is going to get through her and then through the placenta. But it certainly is neurotoxic, there's no question about that. So I'm one of those mothers with um, methylation pathology with a, a spectrum child, and I've also been willing to entertain um, therapies that you and your colleagues haven't yet proven to work, um, because I don't feel like I have time to wait for that proof sure. um, before my child is mature and, um, you know, still has that plasticity, plasticity that I still have in him. Um, so I was encouraged, besides that, I was encouraged to hear you talk about the autism triad, because in the various public, oh, that just went off, the public lectures that I've been at, um, I haven't heard the gut and digestive component really addressed. I found it to be extremely helpful in the expression of my child's pathology to address that factor. Um, and so specifically what I want to get to is the quality of the diet and some of the subject, um, the subjects that you're looking at, whereas you said you didn't think it really was that important mm -hmm. because you're supplementing at you know, this sort of sledgehammer level. Well, that's in the children. But, well, in the children, yes. The quality of their diets is often really poor. They have a strong yeah, thank um, yes. predilection for simple carbohydrates. Yes. Um, they don't have the nutritional intake um, from their food, not from their supplements. Well, to this is the, exactly that. the rationale for supplementing uh, because they don't eat right. And, and we're doing a very important study through the Autism Treatment Network. Um, where we are going to find out exactly what children with autism eat. We have the mothers doing a three-day uh, diet diary of everything that that child eats to the label on the, the uh, vitamins, uh, the labels on the cereals. It's, it's very, in, in, very intense. And then that data is then sent to uh, Rochester where they have the state-of-the-art software to break that diet into 150 nutrients. And our suspicion is um, they may be deficient in particularly vitamin D and iron. So I'm curious though about not just the lack of nutrients in the food that these children are eating, but the presence of harmful um, substances contributing greatly to the oxidative load. And so it's not just that they're not getting the nutrients, but they're eating really toxic, harmful things. Yeah, definite consideration. And breathing and having <laughs> dermal contact and all the other pathways. Uh, okay, we have a couple more. I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, I've noticed in the literature how this does go in and out, how similar mitochondrial disorders and autism are. For instance, uh, if you look at a lot of the lab testing, um, you'll see high ammonias, high lactate, pyruvate levels, et cetera you'll see a lot of the same symptoms, the hypotonia, the poor immunity, um, some of the same sensory issues with the GI system, uh, gagging, not wanting to eat, et cetera. Do you feel that they are possibly one in the same or that whatever major insult affects autism causes a mitochondrial dysfunction and not necessarily a disorder? Well, I, 
children with classic mitochondrial disease with, with a mutation in one, rarely have autism. Sure, like Mila's or something like yes. that. Yes, yes. But um, I think it's an open question whether there is a insufficiency or a dysfunction um, that could contribute. Uh, and again, we're, we're trying to follow up on that to look at the enzyme activity in the kids and um, mitochondrial membrane potential. Um, Do you have a strong feeling about it, like your gut or your intuition as a scientist? As a scientist, I try not to have a gut instinct. <laughs> but actually, as I was talking to the students, um, somebody asked what, what sort of, if I had any advice. And, and one thing that has proven true is you have you know, your, your hypothesis, which is what you think may be true. Um, and, and I'm sure we would all agree that the results that come out backwards <laughs> are really upsetting. but actually can be the most informative. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep an open mind on that and, and follow through. Okay, and um, my second question is, when you discussed the polymorphisms, mm -hmm. and you said that there wasn't any um, significant difference, for instance, in the study population and the general population on the MTHFR, is it likely or possible that perhaps a combination of SNPs could actually be, oh, yeah. you know, in, in, we're looking at, we're looking to find the one major thing, and as you mentioned, I don't think that we're going to ever no. find one major thing, but um, if you look at the pathway, the COMT and the MTHFRs and... Yeah, we, we did publish in 2006 in American Journal of Medical Genetics some interactions between those in the children. Um, that was a different population, actually, from what we have now, what we, in this, this current study, uh, it was more diverse. We didn't, um, you know, it wasn't so carefully controlled. It was definitely spectrum uh, with uh, PDD and OS as well. And so, uh, and we did see some interaction. But we didn't in the moms. I was really kind of thought we might, but um, no, Could you no gene find gene that interaction. In the father also, as far as the SNPs? Not in, no. You would not see those, okay. Well, uh, we only genotyped RFC1 because we saw that in I the see. fathers. We didn't, we were only interested in the mother as a genetic risk factor. So for the fathers only came in when we saw something elevated. But that would be the interesting. Re the reason I ask is I'm a nurse practitioner for Sutter. Mm -hmm. And I became intrigued because I had several patients come in with these defects. And so I decided to look it up and I had several parents who were interested in going and having their testing done, even if they had to pay for it. And what was interesting to me is that the fathers often had the C677T allele defect, oh, really? and the mothers often had maybe a heterozygous defect of the 12988, but not consistently so. I have eight sets of parents who did that. How many? And uh, six of them, the fathers all had the heterozygous C677 T allele. They were TT. And, and I don't know about, you know, it, we didn't do obviously COMT and CBS and all that, but I just thought it was intriguing. Yeah, you know, but when you have an N of eight. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, it actually it turns it's, out yeah. um, nowadays without an N of 500, it's, sure. it's not considered. Really, but you can be intrigued for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Uh, as you know, I study chronic fatigue syndrome in adults, and uh, we find uh, the same metabolic issues yeah. in, in those people as as you're, you've been talking about here yep. for autism. Yep. And uh, anecdotally, uh, we run across a lot of mothers who have. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome who have children with autism yeah, I and that. I know you studied that to some degree and I'd like to hear you comment on that some and uh, you know is it because the mothers are exhausted from having an autistic child or is there is there something else going on? No, I think it's fascinating that chronic fatigue has this profile. Uh, we've not looked at it um, and again um, I don't want to be snobby about it but 
a lot of the the commercial uh, available. Uh, our our profile is done absolutely reproducibly fasting. Um, 9 a.m. before you know same time of day, uh, we chill the immediately. We're very very rigorous. Uh, and I, 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 has that been published in Chronic Fatigue? I'm sorry. You mean the part about the correlation between mothers having a chronic? No, just the metabolic profile. Oh. Um, no. I know it's out there. No, it hasn't but I'm been not published. sure how it was done. Uh, we, we did a study in a, in a, a single private practice, uh, no control group, uh, but we saw uh, a very significant changes in, uh, uh, for example, glutathione. Uh, we treated with uh, uh, a form of B12 and some forms of folate. Yeah, that was interesting. In addition to some other supplements. and. Uh, uh, we saw improvement in uh, uh, SAME, SAMI, we saw improvement in glutathione, and then we had uh, visual analog scales for symptoms, so it was a subjective analysis of, of symptoms, and, uh, but nevertheless we did see a significant improvement in all the measures, both the lab measures and the subjective uh, symptom measures. So, Are you aware uh, of the uh, work out of... Uh Whitmore Institute, that's the XMRV. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're very intriguing. interested in, in Judy's work. Uh, well, actually, she and I are collaborating. I heard that, yeah. I heard that, and I'm very uh, interested to hear that. Well, I'm kind of curious myself. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, we, it, we still don't know at this point, as you know, what the involvement of XMRV is in chronic fatigue syndrome. Is it, is it causative? Is it a passenger? Is it... Right important in some cases but not others. We have a very heterogeneous population, so on. So it remains to be seen, but we're very interested in that. I'm going to have the final question for you. Uh, in your uncontrolled um, trial, where you saw, saw some, of the, some of the children obviously changed dramatically and others stayed the same or even reversed, it went up. Um, were you, uh, did you look at all in any exploratory way at what distinguished those two groups, the, the responders and the non-responders? I mean, it would be very exploratory, but it might be interesting to generate some hypotheses about who might be the, the, uh, Again, the target this was, population. Yeah, I agree, I agree. This was a pilot study, in, you know, low budget, internally funded, um, but we are, uh, using uh, ATN um, uh, kids uh, that are extremely well um, in, our, uh, in our next study where we'll, we will be able to look at what, what characterizes response. the responders. I just yeah. didn't have that information for, on, on the first one. Okay, great. Well, um, I'd like to ask everyone to thank, uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Jill James for really <laughs>